This is B Wing in Hull, one of 13 adult prisons in England and Wales where teenagers are locked up on remand awaiting trial. On an average day, there are 170 teenagers here. Some are only 15 years old. Most boys are untried, innocent until proven guilty, so we can't identify them or discuss their cases. Some are charged with serious crimes, others with car theft. On average, one in three will either be given a non-custodial sentence or be found not guilty. None of the cells has a toilet, so the day starts with slopping out, emptying individual plastic pots. Conditions here for boys on demand are worse than for adults. Recently, the Home Office spent more than a million pounds in hell on an experiment to improve conditions for the most violent of the convicted adults. But not for the untried teenagers. B-Wing has suffered from continuous vandalism. Many cell windows have no glass. Burning blankets have been flipped onto the roof and caused fires. Boys are often locked up here, two to a cell, 20 hours a day, for months at a time. We don't think that Hull B-Wing is a suitable place to have 15 and 16 year olds. It seems to us totally um, inappropriate that these unconvicted youngsters should have to live in what we consider to be um, appalling conditions. The governor has to accept any prisoner sent here. He can't turn teenagers away no matter what he thinks of B-Wing. The conditions in B-Wing are not good and they're not far from being intolerable. The main problem we come across, of course, is not so much overcrowding as the vandalism that flows from prisoners in overcrowded conditions being bored, uh, busy breaking things up. Earlier this year, the Governor and the Independent Board of Prison Visitors invited magistrates from Yorkshire and Humberside to visit Hull. The magistrates would then see for themselves the place where they were remanding teenagers. Mrs Brenda Collins is a member of the Keithley Juvenile Panel. Last September, she and 18 other magistrates travelled to Hull and inspected B-Wing. It was very distasteful and shocking to, to see these conditions. Um, the boys were shouting abuse and they were also um, had homemade strings or small ropes which they were passing, using to pass um, items from cell to cell on different floors. And it gave the impression of an institution out of control. What did you do after the visit? I thought about it for a couple of days, and then I wrote to the Home Secretary. In the last few years, the government has started building new prisons and refurbishing old ones. At the same time, there's been more cautioning and counselling to try to keep teenagers out of the courts. Numbers have dropped. But not the numbers yeah, of teenagers the courts are still remanding to prison. What's your name? When a youngster is charged with a serious offence, the courts have to decide whether it's safe to allow him to be at liberty. If he commits a further offence, everyone is outraged. What have the authorities done? Why have they allowed him to be at liberty? If he's locked up, then unfortunately, as we seek to transform the prison system to make it a modern one, having inherited a deeply run-down prison stock ten years ago, quite obviously some people have to be kept in conditions that I do not consider appropriate. For the last five years, the numbers of teenagers who've been remanded to prison awaiting trial have stayed roughly the same. Last year, 1,613 boys, all under the age of 17, were locked up on remand in adult prisons. In Hull, it's been impossible to segregate them completely from older prisoners. When B wing is full, the overflow is accommodated in the adult wings. This boy is 16. He's charged with murder. He's now been in B wing awaiting trial for seven months. It's just the boredom that gets to you being locked up so much, and I think they could do something to like, you know, take tension away. And that's why they're always 
rioting and all that because they get very frustrated that they're locked up all this time. And some people ain't done all. You know, some people are in for some that they ain't done and they're locked up 23, 24 hours a day. And sometimes loss of pay and all this. And I think it's just nobody should be treated like this. Each cell is about seven feet by nine. Prison pay, a basic one pound sixty-five pence a week, buys a few oddments. There's room for a metal table, a wash bowl, and two pots. How cold is it at night here? Freezing. What do they give you for bedding? Can you show us? What does this? Uh, how many blankets do you get? One and one now. And two That's feet. Sort of cotton sheet. And we found another boy of 16 charged with burglary and car theft. He's homeless and has been for six weeks in a cell with no proper mattress. How is it possible to sleep on a mattress like this? Because I see half of it seems to be... Let me have a look at this, this mattress here. Half of it seems to be torn off. How does that happen? Just some people just pull it apart through madness or throw it out the window. Stuff like that, you know. So how, how can anyone possibly manage to sleep on what's left? I don't know, they just, just have to manage what they've got. They've got no choice, they don't give me no one. This is shit, they give me it's, it's all tattered and that. Was it like that when you got it? Yeah. What were these, these uh, yeah, slips just, to the other side? Yeah, someone's just slate, you know. And trousers and all We've seen many young prisoners in B-Wing who, like this boy, so have been given clothing which change. does not fit and needs repair. So, this is the environment in which 15 and 16-year-old boys are locked up with more experienced older youths. According to the prison inspectorate, it's for 20 hours a day. What about all this mess on the ground? What's, what's all this mess on the ground? Oh, that's what everything's thrown out. Cups, jumpers, bottles, food. Why, and why do people throw things out? Because they have been, isn't it? They have been in your cell. The contents of pots are added to the piles of rubbish on the forecourt. Every few days, a prisoner's working party is allowed to tackle the result. Why are they throwing packets of excreta out of the cells? <laughs> I mean, there's a purely practical reason that uh, if one's locked in one's cell for a long time, keeping it in the cell is not an attractive option. Uh, and that must account for some of that sort of behaviour. Uh, in many cases, I think it isn't actually explained as simply as that. It's part of the vandalism, let's show people, uh, you know, what we can really do. Because there are actually ample opportunities to go to the toilet for anybody with normal bowels and a degree of control, there shouldn't be any need to actually uh, go to the toilet in the cell and have packets of excreta in the cell to throw out of the window. The Home Office has started replacing broken windows with shatterproof plastic and mesh. It took ten months to get the first six windows renewed. They're all about putting these new gridded windows in which I think, you know, they're just going to rip them out again. They're just going to end up kicking them out. They put one in next door and they kick that out. If they put it in, you know, there'll be no contact with other lads only on compound. You won't be able to talk to them and all like that. So they'll just end up rioting and kicking them out again. They're just stupid. Will the boys now be able to put their heads out through the windows and talk to each other? Uh, no, they won't be able to put their heads out the windows, nor throw things out the windows with the same success they had previously. But if they can't put their heads out of the window and talk to other people in the block, what is going to be the effect of that on their morale? Well, they will be, in fact, able to shout out of the windows. I mean, though, if we open the windows, you can see there's a grill which prevents putting your head out. In fact, you can speed through that perfectly happily. There's no longer any need to stick your head out with all those sort of uh, difficulties as that, of course, mainly things being thrown out of windows. If you've got um, uh, very high-spirited adolescents locked up in cells like this for, what, sometimes 20 hours a day, unable to put their heads out of the window and talk to their friends, is that going to be good? Yes, in fact, they aren't locked up for as long as 20 hours a day. When we actually work it on that, it's a lot less than that. Uh, locking up high-spirited adolescents is never an ideal. Uh, in many ways, I'd much prefer not to be locking up adolescents. 
the less we have, the better. While windows stay broken, there are opportunities for trade. What are these strings for here? I see there is... <laughs> now, that if one of the prison officers came in, I'd get a nick for that. I'd lose a lot of days for that. I'd lose about 14 days. Well, you're, not, you're not supposed to have these lines out of the window? No. What, what are the lines for? That's for when you're locked up and you can't go round to other people's pads. You just swing a line to next door. You just, like him, he's just said, I've got his line. That's his line over there. Well, so people can pass things backwards and forwards? Yeah. When you're locked up, you see, you can't get through each other's things, so you just pass a line to next door and they'll pass it all the way around. Sometimes they go right to end the B wing and all the way around. And, you know. What sort of things are being passed around? Oh, cigarettes and bottles of pop. Well, so you can tie something on there? Yeah. And then what do you do? He's, you see, I'd swing it and he's got it all there. Stan's, Stan's got it all there, and I'd swing it to Stan. The prison authorities, it seems, have not been able to control this trafficking or the barons who profit from it. First time. <laughs> what, you were, th you were throwing something along to this chap over here? Yeah, that line was there because you were going to pass me a cig after the slot party. <laughs> Half past 11 and time for lunch. Prison officers can then lock everyone up again and have their lunch hour from 12.15. And you say it's the same food every day? You mean the same kind of food? No, the same food every day. You don't mean exactly the same, surely? Nearly every day. All the time you get taste and cabbage. That's what the food you get in the room. And, and what's it like? Looks all right. Want to taste it? Can I taste some? Right here. Yeah. You've got, what, potatoes and a sort of stew. Can I use this? Yeah. Let's see what it's like. It's not bad, it's a bit cold, isn't it? Lumpy and all. <laughs> and lumpy, yes, that's true. Mm. Potatoes are lumpy, but well, what's it like every day? Is this, is this special just because we're here or what? No, you get that every day, potatoes every day, and cabbage. Mm -hmm. Not special today. These are the uh, metal trays that uh, the inmates use to take the food back up to their cells. The problem that we have with these, as you see, all about design has got a very sharp edge. That was, uh, yes, about two or three months ago we had an officer very seriously injured when an inmate uh, threw this tray at his head and almost completely severed half of his ear. Uh, the officer was off duty for almost two months. Prisoners in B-Wing are allowed regular exercise. It's supposed to be for an hour. But when it rains, their yard is waterlogged and unusable. The prison is not able to provide a change of dry clothing. The authorities are short of staff, but do what they can. Each landing on B-Wing gets its turn at what's called association. In theory, two hours a day out of the cell. There's a man in your room, and you do not remember his name. There's a rotor for showers and various indoor pursuits. The prison hires videos in bulk from a nearby shop. And when it's not in use, the machine is locked in a box over the altar in a room which sometimes serves as a chapel. Today, a conventional film is on show. A few days earlier, we'd seen juveniles watching another offering. It featured a scantily dressed woman in a locked room pursued by a burr constrictor. In between, the prison tries to offer education. These are some of the youngest boys in B-Wing. They've not benefited from the recent schemes to keep juveniles out of the courts. Now, when they ought to be at school outside, they've ended up in an adult prison. Which means that the families suffer by having to travel from here all the way It's the youngest boys, under 17, who most concern the board of visitors and the staff. Like all adults on remand, boys are only allowed 15 minutes visiting time a day. Remember that, that for some of these younger ones, they are away from home perhaps for the first time. Some of them have parents who live at quite some distance. Visits, they're on remand, they can be daily, they are short visits. It's a long way to come for a short visit to your son from Sheffield, especially when 
you can't see him on your own. You've got to sit at either side of a long bench with, with a low partition in the middle of it. Um, it's not very conducive to family relationships. And so I think that some of these boys do feel very much abandoned there. The boy in this cell says he hasn't had a visit in six weeks. His grandmother lives 50 miles away in Leeds. Still far from my grandma not to come. It was too expensive for him as well, so I would not come. There's no point in coming in here because they get 15 minutes. And from my grandma to trap all that work just for 15 minutes, it's pointless. There is a large amount of misery in the place. People who are locked up awaiting trial, often deserted by their families, often feeling deserted by their families, um, with other prisoners who are mistreating them, because that seems to be the major factor. They're in great distress, and people in great distress will resort to things like uh, self mutilation or real suicide attempts. And it's our job to try and make sure they aren't successful. So far, we've been fairly good at that, but I should never sit back and say we've, we've got a perfect system. We have not. Ready to go? Yep. Come on, lads. All staff, the governor says, have been instructed to be alert for signs of depression, particularly at the morning sick parade. Since the recent suicides at Leeds and elsewhere, prisons have been asked to Hello, monitor morning, all suspected well, suicide you, attempts and incidents of self-mutilation. So far this year, there have been 77 of these attempts in Hull, almost all in B-Wing. Last year, prisoners tried to get a hospital transfer by swallowing batteries from their radios. A few kids did it first. I didn't do it until about 20 minutes after they'd done it, and banging on the door and it was getting took away. So I thought, oh, you know, what's happening? They're getting took away. They're probably going to outside hospital. So instead of swallowing the full battery, because if you swallow the, like, a full battery, you're bound to get, you know, stick stitches and that. So I was like swallowing the black stuff out of the battery. We do keep a close watch and monitor incidents, and those incidents include with slashing, and as we had last year, battery swallowing, um, the occasional attempted hanging. And These have all happened in B-Wing. These have all happened in B-Wing, yes. The boy in this cell tells us that when he was on the second floor, the twos, he once discovered his cellmate trying to slash his wrists. There's loads of kids that slash up. Slash up, you mean? Yeah, cut the wrists because I can't do it. How do they do that? Just get a razor. And they give you razors? Yeah, I want one there. You actually seen people here to do that? Yep. What did you see? You need to will sh to just shout out with it that I'm going to slash up and just hold it out like that and just cut the sends up like that. Just do it in front of your eyes and that blood just goes on the floor. And you've seen that happen? Yeah. I had a pad met on tools. No one on the top won't. And in the morning, he won't. He took his words. Lots of blood on the floor. And his face were blue. What did he do? Slashed his wrist. He didn't die though, he recovered from it. What are you doing about the fact that so far this year there have been 77 recorded cases in this prison of suicide attempts or mutilation attempts? Uh, what we're doing is trying to reduce uh, the possibility of suicide to the minimum. We have not had any successful suicides at Hull amongst our young offender population since we opened as a young offender establishment. But I should not be complacent about that. There are, as you correctly say, a number of instances of self-mutilation and mainly uh, occasions when inmates scratch at their wrists with no real possibility of killing themselves and they're aware of that. They hope that they will be taken to the hospital uh, which will remove them from the pressures of other inmates bullying them. The major factor that leads to um, incidents of self-mutilation is undoubtedly bullying. All our uh, attempts to work out what's happening suggests that to be the case. Uh, we spend a long time with those who have actually committed such acts and try and work out why they did it. We try and take steps to prevent those sort of things happening again. I cannot, in grossly overcrowded conditions, prevent bullying.
A report on Hull by the Chief Inspector of Prisons, Judge Stephen Tumim, was published earlier this year. The report made 72 different recommendations. They covered everything from sanitation to fire doors, from changes of clothing to the prevention of bullying. More than half of the recommendations concerned B-Wing. Judge Tumim's report concluded that unless conditions were improved very promptly, teenage prisoners should be evacuated in the interests of humanity. If you keep young people uh, locked up for 20 hours or more a day, that is corrupting for them. They very soon disorientate. They lose their sense of time. Uh, they do what I'm afraid happened quite a lot in Hull at the time when I visited. They mutilate themselves and cut themselves to either to attract attention or some sort of mild suicide threat or attempt. Uh, it is disastrous. And uh, I took the view in Hull that from what I saw, that either there was a speedy, really substantial improvement in the way they lived in their regimes, or they ought to be put somewhere else and taken away. It wasn't a fit place for them. The authorities claim that there have been recent improvements. Fewer juveniles, more association time, more windows. But otherwise, as far as we've been able to see, not much has changed. What makes the effect worse is the length of time on remand. One 16-year-old boy has just spent 11 months here. Jason Batley has given us permission to explain how he came to be in Hull for nearly a year when he was 16. Jason was born in Barnsley and from the age of five when his parents separated was brought up by his mother. At secondary school, Jason started stealing motorbikes and breaking into shops. He was sentenced to six months' detention. In 1986, on his mother's initiative, the local council sent him to this special boarding school. He was a lad in this school who took every possible opportunity to take part in football, long-distance walks, outdoor pursuits. He was a child who, still at the age of 15, was playing cowboys and Indians. In their assessment, the school said Jason had specific learning difficulties. They still got a tape recording of one of his history projects. The school said Jason was immature, prone to temper tantrums, had a hearing disorder, involuntary eye rolling and a facial tick. In October last year, Jason and an older boy were charged with robbing the owner of this house in Barnsley and causing her grievous bodily harm. After the break-in, Mrs Margaret Sutton was found with a broken leg and ribs. She died a few days later. The news of what had happened caused widespread anger and distress, although the court accepted that she died of natural causes. At the age of 16, Jason, who'd had no previous conviction for assault, was remanded to B-Wing. Jason Batley pleaded not guilty and wrote home regularly. He asked for soap, shampoo and comics. His mother sometimes managed to travel 50 miles to Hull for a 15-minute visit. He won't plead guilty for quite a while. And I had a talk to him and he still insisted. And then the solicitor told me that out of the blues, just before the court days, he just said, I'm going to plead guilty. So when I went to see Jason again, then before the court case, I said, why did you plead guilty for? Did you do it? He says, no, I didn't do anything, ma'am. I was there, but I didn't do anything. But I've, I've pleaded guilty because to get it over with, I'm fed up now. During 11 months in B-Wing, Jason Batley several times slashed his wrists. He changed his plea to guilty and a month later appeared at Sheffield Crown Court. The judge, David Bentley QC, sentenced him to four years. After a year on remand, Jason was taken to Leeds, a prison where there have recently been six suicides. And I would think that the effect of that sort of incarceration would have a very, very depressive effect on the kid. Um, certainly, um, it would not, um, how can I put it? 
I, I think it will probably end up Jason feeling suicidal. Instead of spending 11 months in B-Wing, Jason could have been sent to another sort of prison where teenagers are held on remand. Morning. This is the Acliffe Centre for this. Children in County Morning. Durham. Many of these teenagers face charges which are just Morning. as serious Morning. as those of B-Wing's occupants. Many are on remand and will have to wait just as long before they're dealt with by the courts. In other ways, however, a cliff couldn't be more different. The secure unit of 50 beds is mixed with separate blocks for boys and girls. In the assessment centre, a staff of five care for 14. The ratio is six times better than the equivalent in B-Wing. The director of Aiklip is keen to impress like visitors mild, with the importance of the right environment. You see the kind of wood detail that we've got on the corner. All of it makes the place look luxurious and really more like a hotel or a university hall of residence than a maximum security place. So how secure are these, are these cells? They are maximum security. <laughs> they are maximum security. If I could draw your attention to the wall, the walls are made of a mixture of cement and fiberglass. You need pneumatic drills before you can get through these. There is just no possibility of getting through them. You notice that the angle of the roof is irregular for two reasons. Firstly, because we don't want the children to be able to get at the heating and the lighting. And secondly, because again, we are trying to create an enriching as opposed to a predictable institutional type of environment. But this room can be emptied in exactly 20 seconds flat and we can thoroughly search it in 20 seconds flat. But as you can see, it has decent quality carpeting, which actually matches uh, and tones in with the, with the bed covers. Um, and uh, it is an environment which is totally safe from the public's point of view, totally and absolutely secure, but yet it is a decent environment. What about the window here? Well, uh, this window is keyed in on 16 different points to, to the tune of 18 inches at any one of those points. And there is just no possibility of breaking it out. You actually need an acetylene torch before you can get through this particular window. There is no possibility of doing anything with that. Um, the child cannot use the bedding in order to barricade uh, herself or himself into the room because the, the doors open outwards. And the only way that the child can hurt herself or himself is by attempting self-strangulation and hanging. And these are all of them on Velcro. But you couldn't possibly have a place like this in, in an ordinary civil prison, surely. Why on earth not? It's no more expensive than a prison, it is no less safe than a prison, but it's a much more civilised type of environment. It is absolute nonsense, people going around saying that you need to have a brutalising and brutal type of environment for prisoners. It is perfectly possible to have a decent and civilised environment with the marvellous consequence that actually people who are placed in a decent environment behave, broadly speaking, in a decent way. The Duke and Duchess of York are now among Aycliffe's patrons. They've presented one of their wedding cakes to the centre and visited by helicopter. In 1985, the Duke opened Royston House, one of the secure units here. It's the assessment centre where disturbed children or those on remand spend their first few weeks. Aycliffe may cost the same as a prison to build, but has higher staffing costs. It's run by Durham County Council and overseen by the Department of Health. It takes children from all over Britain and by charging their local authorities is self-financing. The surroundings may be different from B-Wing, but the cases on remand are equally difficult. They have done horrible things. They are frequently horrible people. And therefore it's understandable that people should feel so angry about what they've done. We have them here. Murder and rape and arson and robbery and bashing old ladies on the head and uh, assaulting little children. You name it, we've got it here. At Aycliffe, there is now a 16-year-old boy from Yorkshire who was charged with murder, taken to Hull and then brought here where he's costing his council about £1,000 a week. In B Wing at Hull, there is another 16 year old boy from Yorkshire, remanded on the same charge and with the same delay. He was not chosen for this sort of treatment. It only cost the taxpayer £280 a week to keep him in prison. 
there are some young people who have committed crimes which are horrible, terrible crimes. Well, such as horrific murder. Does it really matter if they are kept on remand in a place like, like B-Wing at Hull Prison? It depends on what you're after. If you are after not washing your hands off that young person forever and more, then the answer must be categorically yes. But if, on the other hand, you don't care for your young person, for what happens to him and what the outcome of all your public investment in him is going to be, then obviously the answer is no. Our experience of receiving young people who have been on remand in prison suggests that that is a horrific and severely damaging experience for most of them. The sorts of young people who eventually get serious sentences of the type that we're talking about are almost never the public's conception of a straightforward thug or decent ordinary criminals. They're not. They're usually severely disturbed psychologically, socially, and in a whole variety of other ways. All that happens to them is that by that one experience of remand in prison, a whole huge bag full more of nails is put in their coffin. Deciding whether a boy will be remanded to a place like B-Wing or Aitliff starts at court. Before a juvenile can be sent to any prison, he has to be charged with a serious offence and brought before a court. The courts give bail if they can, but if the charge is serious, they have other options. If a boy's alleged offence is burglary or worse, the magistrates can remand him straight to prison for seven days. But the court could remand him into the care of the local council's social workers instead. Sometimes this can still be a route to B-Wing. Social workers can claim that a boy is too violent or disruptive for them, and if the court agrees, he's sent to prison. He and other children, mainly at his instigation, we, we feel, barricaded themselves into the upper floor of the building, and the police had to be called to remove them. Uh, the Social workers day, in Humberside don't have any floor, secure accommodation of their own. Fast car. In difficult cases, when they decide that a boy is work, too disruptive, they can sign what's known as an unruly certificate. And this usually means that he ends up in B-Wing. In Humberside, there are special children's homes, but they're not secure and couldn't replace B-Wing. There is a plan to build a new remand prison at Everthorpe and a smaller unit in Hull, but both schemes have run into difficulties. They couldn't open before 1992 and building hasn't even started. In both cases, the proposed prisons have aroused local anxiety. A 15-year-old can do just as much harm uh, as a 25-year-old person, uh, and the public have a right to be protected from people, uh, particularly the elderly. Uh, as you will notice, the looking around the area, uh, there's a substantial number of elderly people in the area. We have something about seven residential homes in a very short area, very small area. And most of these people are terrified of these youngsters. It doesn't worry you if a 15-year-old boy is remanded in custody to prison? Not if they've done what they reckon they're doing. Not if they'd mug my mother. I would hang him up from a tree. So I think it's terrible the things they do. And I think prison, if, if they've gone and mugged old people like they do in this town, they're just there putting them in prison and I have no sympathy whatsoever. There's too many do-gooders who pat them on the head and say, you've come from a broken home, you've got no job, and I haven't sympathy with them. So far this year, Humberside courts have remanded more than 60 boys to be with. In the same period, Humberside Council have only diverted six boys into places like Acliffe. There are some children who are not going to be amenable to a secure care environment. There are some children who are still going to say, look, I don't want to know anything about care, I'm not interested, I'm, as it were, determined on a career of crime. And there comes a point where, because these resources are scarce, that we sometimes have to make very, very difficult decisions. And it's almost a sheep and goats exercise. And say, right, well, you will go into prison custody, whereas somebody else will go into secure care. But are you saying that in some cases there are 15 and 16 year old boys for whom there's no, no, you have no other choice, there's no other hope but to put them into B-Wing? That's, that's a sort of dustbin for them. Und, under the present legislation and with the current range of resources, yes. In Humberside, if a social worker wants to keep an unruly boy out of Hull Prison, but contained, there are not many options. 
Aycliffe in County Durham is a national centre specialising in emotionally disturbed boys and girls and is usually full. Keppel's View near Rotherham has four beds, is usually full too and can only take juveniles for 28 days. The only other nearby choice is Eastmore near Leeds. Eastmore has 27 beds and is mainly reserved for boys sent here by Leeds Social Services. It too is usually full. On the day we came here, 12 of the 27 boys had been previously remanded to B-Wing in Hull. They're all boys the courts have decided must be locked up for the protection of the public. Keeping them in secure accommodation costs ratepayers about a thousand pounds a week. If people need to be protected from those young people, I'm afraid you have to pay for it. Secure accommodation is expensive to build, it's expensive to starve, expensive to run. Eastmore claims that boys who come here, rather than to B-Wing, are less likely to take up crime. This boy has just spent nine months in Hull. When we last saw him there, he was banging on his cell door all day. We can do what we want most of the time. We can go to the gym. Come up here at night time to play on computers, do games. Teenagers in Eastmore don't take their meals back to their cells and eat alone. They're trusted with metal knives and forks and eat together with an adult at each table. There are other even more significant differences. We've never had an actual suicide attempt. What about self-mutilation, scratching the, the wrists and arms? Um, thinking back, I think there are one, two boys who, when they've gone home for home leave, have come back with tattoos. But I, I can't think of anybody else who's actually cut themselves deliberately in some form of attention seeking. Has there been any battery swallowing here? We uh, have one of our current residents who, who did uh, allegedly consumed batteries whilst in Hull, but nobody's ever done it here. But the ultimate test for this sort of accommodation is whether it's more effective than prison in weaning a teenager away from crime. Can you imagine what drawback it is for a 15-year-old to have been placed in Hull on remand? Not only do we know from, from the Chief Inspector's report that that young person's likely to be involved in self-abuse, self-mutilation and even suicide. But when he comes out, how is he ever going to go back to education? Can you imagine any school in the country wanting to take somebody who'd done time in an adult prison? So you've ruined his educational chances. Because you've ruined his educational chances, you've ruined his chances for employment. You've actually created a long-term adult criminal problem by the very process that you set out with when the child was 15. <laughs> two thirds of all teenagers sent to prison reoffend within two years. In 1975, an all party commons committee said the practice of remanding juveniles in adult prisons should cease forthwith. In 1977, 14 year old girls were taken out of the prison system. In 1979, 15 and 16 year old girls were removed. In 1981, 14-year-old boys were excluded. In Britain last year, there were still more than 1,600 boys under 17 years old who were locked up on remand in adult prisons. I, for one, would love it if the courts had more confidence in the local authority system and were prepared to remand people into the care of local authorities rather than into prison. But I cannot usurp their functions. What does it say about Britain that 15 and 16 year old boys are still locked up on remand in conditions like that? You persist in asking a question that fails to take account of the fact that we have to start from the point at which a crime is committed and we know that the peak age for offending in our society today is 15 and a number of 15 and 16 year olds commit very serious offences uh, uh, and I'm afraid that you would be equally aggrieved 
Uh, and indeed, you would have more justification in being aggrieved if we had a system which didn't permit the courts in certain circumstances to confine youngsters who, if they are allowed at liberty, would then go out and commit further serious offences. And I suspect that, uh, uh, that it's a very difficult judgment to make in each individual case. But we have made proposals for change. Uh, but unfortunately, a number of those groups we consulted who have an important voice on this, the police, the magistrates, felt that we were going too far the other way, that we were restricting their rights too much. And of course, the first time that some youth who, sh who the courts would have wished to send into custody on remand, who was let at liberty, then commits another serious offence. It's no good a minister saying, I was badgered by Panorama into agreeing uh, that it was awful, the present arrangements, and therefore change them, because I'd be badgered by Panorama again as to why I'd failed to protect the public. This 16-year-old has at last been given a date for his trial, the 5th of March. By then, he will have spent 11 months in Hull Prison. Last night in B-Wing, there were 170 prisoners, 23 of them under 17 years old. Shine bright like a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond.